Breeze. Everyone, this is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. We've covered, well, uh, all, most of the DC books, most of, the, most of the Marvel books, so, on to the, on to the last bit, as well as this week's Boom Studios title. Well, this month's act. No, 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 this week's. We have two from Boom at the moment. So, kicking things off, we've got Death of Doctor Strange, number three. Where we had left off, the three sisters had appeared and began wreaking havoc on the earth and and decided that uh, this was, in fact, a suitable feeding ground for their chi for the child. Um, meanwhile, a uh, a portion of Doctor Strange's soul from his younger days is helping to unravel the, me the means of his death. So the issue begins in Avengers Mountain with the shadow of Doctor Strange at attend observing his the autopsy of Doctor Strange, of himself being conducted by uh, Doctor Jane Foster. Meanwhile, Clea informs the uh, the Avengers as to who the uh, the three mothers are. They explain, explain that they came from beyond the outer planets. Three warrior queens of, queens of unknown lands carving their way across the dimensions. An army of three whose mandate is sheer annihilation. And it's explained that the peregrine child or the child is hunger. Uh, the way the way Clea explains it is that it hungers for magic. It is the apex predator of the magical food chain, a thalmivore with, with, with an appetite that can never be sated, and its favorite prey, powerful beings of magic, like the warlords, like her. No one knows its origins. Some claim it is not a creature at all, but the feeder expression of some vast nth dimensional hypercreature, the only part of it our minds can perceive in material space. The Mother's Arts Vanguard tracking down powerful magic being, magical beings so that it might feed. No one knows how the, the, three, the three mothers became the three mothers. And yet Cleus suspects that those are stories of great tragedy. But, uh, Dr. Strange explains that uh, not only was he killed, but his soul was taken. So he, so that way, the reason, part of, so a problem is that, uh, is that uh, unless he figured, unless he manages to put everything back together in seven days, there will not, there will never be another Sorcerer Supreme. But uh, Wong explains that Earth is the perfect place for the warlords, for all the various mystical warlords to hide. He's explained, you know, Earth has turned away threat, threats such as Dormammu, Thanos, Annihilus, Shumagorath, Galactus. You know, taking down Galactus is like what? A, a Tuesday afternoon for Earth's heroes? So yeah. And these mystical warlords all know this. They're just like, these guys take down Dormammu, and they don't break a sweat doing it. That's where we're gonna hide. Basically, they want to make the three mothers the problem of our superheroes. But it turns out that uh, Doctor Strange has has managed to get some information about his about his. Doctor Strange knows that some, someone did kill him, and so he has some avenging of his own to do. Um, later, Clea sends a, a, an astral servant of hers to find various things, and she talks with Doctor Strange. Now, this is a, now I don't normally read Doctor Strange, so I was unaware. I, I knew I knew who Clea was, but I didn't know the, about the falling out they had had. So apparently, they had they had a falling out, but they patched things up. Got back together, 
And, however, in remaking the universe, Steven had to give, had to give up, uh, basically her, Clea's memories of Strange were erased by, by Mephisto. But, uh, her rational sort of returns, she's found the things they were looking for in a, uh, in Castle Mordo. And so, we have two, two sieges occurring at once. In the mountains of Transylvania, Castle Mordo, Doctor Strange, Clea, and Wong attack Baron Mordo. Meanwhile, seven miles off the course of coast of Cornwall, in Kalamesh, in the domain of the, dark, of the warlord Dagoth, the three mothers have arrived. Um, it, 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 the basis is back and forth with showing the assault on uh, Castle Mordo and the assault on Kalamesh, with uh, Dagoth uh, asking the other warlords for help, and then basically saying, Nope, Vic, we're, this we're gonna lie about the fact you're the first of us to fall. But, uh, And Dagoth is brought before the Peregrine Child. While Doctor Strange demands that uh, Mordo show himself and bring bring him his cloak and, uh, and the Eye of Agamotto, which Mordo is holding. And that is where the issue ends. I'm really not sure where this is going. Um, I'm fairly convinced that when all is said and done, Doctor Strange will be back to how we know and love him, but we'll see. It, it, I wouldn't put it past Marvel to, to pull a fast one like that, but we'll see. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Hulk, number one. So, okay. First things first. I've... I've never really been a Hulk fan. Uh, there are Hulk stories I, I like, especially uh, Planet Hulk. World War Hulk's pretty good, too, but I've never been a big Hulk fan. Just, you know, not really my jam. Um, that said, from what I've heard, I would probably actually really enjoy Immortal Hulk. And I may have to track down collected editions on that one. Maybe even uh, talk about them on, stream, on, on the channel. We'll see. Uh, but anyways, um, I opted to pick up Hulk number one because it's being written by it's written by Donny Cates, and Donny Cates had a phenomenal run on Venom. I'm loving his Thor run, so you know his his tell his Guardians run was his Guardians run was too damn short, but it was great. And I wish I'd read his uh, Doctor Strange run. So anyway. So, in the after, in Immortal Hulk, apparently, in the aftermath of Immortal Hulk, Bruce Banner has managed to do the unthinkable, and he has separated, he has partitioned off his uh, psyche, and he, he's done some interesting things. But the issue begins with the Hulk beating up, beating on a door. On the other side of said door is Banner. So we get some opening narration. Um, from Doctor, we found out from Doctor Strange. I have long held a theory about the Hulk. <laughs> I never shared it before now because, well, frankly, it terrifies me to my very core. We have always thought of the Hulk as the manifestation of Doctor Banner's trauma that he experienced as a child, or perhaps his id, his shadow, his fury, his rage. But what if? What if the Hulk has none of those things? What if he exists to protect us from Banner? But uh, Banner's apparently on a, uh, a spaceship and starts from getting all ready to go. Betty chides him for, use, for mistreating the Hulk and he promptly tells her he got out of his head. 
turns out, um, Bruce Banner has turned the Hulk into a spaceship. He's the captain. The Hulk's body is the ship itself with um, tech stolen from AIM grafted onto it. And the Hulk's rage is the engine. But Iron Man en engages him and yeah, um, Iron the Hulk bus is getting smashed to pieces. Even with it, drones and yeah. But uh, But, yeah, Hulk, Hulk takes down the Hulkbuster pretty quick, as, you know, per normal. Apparently he's going to an old Stark Industries base, which is the home of Project Ark, something that uh, Tony's been building ever since piloting a Celestial during the during Null's attack. Using latent Celestial energies to create a wormhole to a pocket dimension, is the idea of saving it of evacuating civilians in the event of another event level attack. And Banner thinks it's good work, actually, but he needs to, he needs to borrow it. And he goes he goes through the portal. But as he's leaving, he simply states that uh or he, sa he sends out a trans he puts out a transmission stating the following. If you can hear this message, then I'm already gone. I am broadcasting this not to explain myself, but as a warning. I'm leaving not because I hate you, not because I'm scared of you. I'm leaving because none of you will know how to deal with what I'm going to become. You all have your little plans, your armored suits, your rocket ships, all of your clever ideas on how to deal with my mo monsters should his actions not prove to be in your best interests. But, you aren't dealing with him anymore. You're dealing with me. And I promise, you have no plan for me. Because I am not controlled by my rage anymore. I am fueled by it. And that is where the issue ends. Interesting. Um, it, it's... Definitely an interesting title, book. I... I I'm kind of loving how, you know, after Immortal Hulk and Venom's run, Venom run, Immortal, Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk run and Donny Cates' Venom run ended, the two of them basically said, hey, you, uh, you want to switch characters? Sure. And they're like, yeah, sure. So they did. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got DC vs. Vampires, number two. Where we left off, um, Andrew Bennett, the vampire, was, uh, Went to the Justice League to ask for help and was promptly killed by a by a fellow vampire, Green Lantern. It was revealed that uh, there had been a shift in vampire leadership, and the new leadership did not believe that the taunt between mankind and vampire and vampire kind was worth the paper was printed on. So, went began by going after the super villains, and uh, yeah, it's supposed to be kind of a surprise. Hey, we're we're back to open war. But uh, the issue begins with Green Lantern attacking uh, Anton Arcane, eventually killing him, and then talking with his master. Turns and his master is, is worried that maybe Andrew Bennett got managed to tell someone. Of course, we know he did, as he did, he managed to get a letter, and, as well as a vial of Lex Luthor's blood, to Batman. So, meanwhile, in Gotham, it's daytime, in a solarium, and the Bat Family's meeting, per Batman's instructions. Alfred's got tea for everyone, cocoa for Damien. And Batman tells them everything that's happened. Elsewhere, a group of supervillains are meeting. Everyman, Cheshire, um, maybe Shimmer. I'm not sure who the other one is. But uh, 
they're hearing grumblings of vampires and monsters and villains. But uh, Green Arrow assures them it's not it's, that that's the truth. And turns out every man is one of them, and so Green Arrow takes him down. But uh, Batman explains. Goes back over his running with the Mad Monk many, many years ago with the rest of the Bat family. Explaining how he approaches dealing with the supernatural anymore. But he also has that they have to assume every team has got, every team has been infiltrated. The, out, the Titans, the Outsiders, the Birds of Prey. The Lee, that would be... That would be quite the coup, though. They're, they're fairly, they, they actually don't think the Lee would maybe safe, but, well, it's not. Turns out that... Uh, because, of course, it bears the question. How does he know if someone isn't... How does he know if someone from the Bat family isn't a vampire? The tea they were all drinking was was prepared with holy water. And for the final test, they all take off take off on their gloves, and they hold a crucifix. Even Damien manages to pull this one off. But Batman manages their new weapons and explains that no, they're not they're not trying to stop vampires or catch them. They're trying to kill them. Which is okay because they're really they're already dead. But uh, Alfred states he also is drinking drink is being one drinking the tea with Batman. You know, being one saying I'm doing this so you know that I actually am that I actually did and I'm not a vampire. And Batman explains that one of the boilers was uh, was blessed anyway, so you know he would he would already have known. That night, however, Green Lantern meets with the Flash, and they talk. And well, you know, so, you know, hey, you know, I'm always, I always want to be there. You know, if something bad happens, I want, I want us to be there for each other. If something good happens, I want us to be there for each other. Well, something really good happened for me, but the rest of the vampires stated that the Flash has to die because. Well, he'll, with his metabolism and his speed, there won't be any food left on the planet. And so, Hal kills Barry and tells his body that he wanted to, he wanted to conquer the world with him. And that is where the issue ends. This is definitely turning out to be an interesting uh, mini so far. It feels like a slightly more lighthearted version of Deceased. But still lighthearted, but still just serious enough that it's not straight up satire like Marvel Zombies was. Or at least the old Marvel Zombies. Anyway, moving on to our last. Our next book, we've got Batman Reptilian, number six, the series finale. Where we left off, after finding, after making, after the creature made its way to its mother, Killer Croc, it seemingly ate Batman. And with and the Batmobile was uh, following it, and uh, with Volkov trapped inside. But uh, Volkov gets ejected, and uh, the Batmobile is used basically as a projectile, and caught, explodes upon hitting the creature. Batman cuts his way out of the creature, and then uh, argues with the with Volkov. However, it turns out that uh, the creature is still alive, and uh, but 
but um, make, Batman makes some calls, tas tases uh, Croc. A government operative shows up and takes the creature as well as Croc into custody. Croc's being taken into custody, so he's going to be studied and figure out what he is exactly. Batman is willing to trust that this agency isn't going to turn the creature into a uh, weapon of mass destruction, but, well, I doubt he trusts them that much. And, uh, that's where our story ends, and, yeah, that, it's pretty to look at, but as a, but to read, it's kind of, eh. Uh, neat thing, it also has the original pitch for the story, which apparently was, uh, originally to be, uh, drawn by the late Steve Dillon, a frequent, who was a frequent, uh, collaborator with Garth Ennis at the time. That is where the series ends. Like I said, it was a, it was pretty. The series itself was pretty to look at, but the writing was a little rough, in my opinion. Which brings us now to our final book for the week, House of Slaughter, number two, where we left off while focusing, the focus now having moved from Erica Slaughter to uh, Aaron Slaughter. Aaron was tracking down a former member of the House of Slaughter with the intention of killing him. So a member was, of course, was, it turns out, the first man that Aaron ever loved. Jace. Jace Slaughter, formerly Jace Boucher. But flashes back to when they were kids at the House of Slaughter with the two of them rooming together, temporarily at least. And he... But Jace goes through the uh, the untethering the untethering ceremony, wherein briefly the monster bound to his totem is untethered, and then well retethered. We also see uh, Aaron and uh, Erica do some tra doing some training. Young Aaron and Erica dealing with their totems. Um, but Jace untethers and then retethers his totem and takes on the name Jace Slaughter. And that night, actually early that morning, while or that night while uh, apparently Chase is having trouble sleeping, or well, Aaron crawls, you know, trying to be comforting, crawls in the bed next to him. The issue ends back in you know fifteen back fifteen years later, however, and it seems that. Uh, Jace is a bit closer with his uh, with the creature inside his totem. And that is where the issue ends. And that's it for this week's roundup. Um, like I said, uh, I'm starting to have second thoughts as to whether or not next week's roundup will be, will be delayed or just or not. Uh, we'll, we'll, honestly, we'll see. We'll, we'll we'll see at the very least. We'll see when Wednesday comes around. Um, but, um, of course, we're likely going to build a team coming next week. Uh, there's other stuff I do. We've got, you know, our beginning of the month, you know, our event recaps and whatnot. But, uh, anyway, that's it for now. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.